Hi, folks. So we're back again for our last uh, section on um, African Americans in the United States. This is going to cover the post civil rights era, uh, particularly civil rights to Black Lives Matter. Um, this is uh, obviously a much more contemporary piece. And um, one of the things that we want to keep in mind, like with the previous two units, is that there are concerted systems in place that have denied African Americans the ability to achieve what we know as socioeconomic success or mobility. Um, and it's particularly important because um, as we've continuously seen issues affecting minority communities, we want to kind of unearth or bring out what um, particular elements in our society's policies, practices, so on and so forth, that um, deny individuals their ability to, you know, be uh, successful, right, to be integrated into this um, social world. And what I think uh, we've seen, particularly in the post-Reconstruction era with the rise of Jim Crow and what we'll see today with mass incarceration is a transformation of the race politics. So it's not that um, there are individuals, which I mean, there are um, concerted folks that are um, racist, but there are other individuals making political and policy decisions that are having the effects of racism without it actually saying race, right? Or just spe speaking race specifically. And so one thing to keep in mind with this, right? As you're learning these different ideas and learning these different um, you know, factoids about history is that, um, again, these issues are still affecting folks, right? Um, there are African-Americans today that are still entrapped in the system of mass incarceration that have you know, denied them the right to vote, the right to um, get good jobs, housing, so on and so forth. And um, we need to do more to change these things. And, and one of the easiest ways to make effective change in any of these scenarios is to vote. Um, and this is one thing I stress with all of my students across the spectrum is the easiest way to deal with social justice issues in your community is to become act civically engaged or actively civically engaged by way of either voting for individuals, running for office, um, supporting campaigns, um, so on and so forth. Um, because a lot of the issues that we see in our society today are there because um, various politicians put those forward, right? Remember our race making model, um, many of the ways in which race has come to the fore um, in Western thinking, um, particularly here in the United States, has been through um, uh, voting for individuals that support race-based agendas, right? So a way to correct that is for us to go out and actually take power or take power back, right? And, and advance a much more progressive agenda where we start to make uh, <laughs> excuse me, um, more meaningful change in these, um, or more meaningful change that will stop these systems of oppression. So with, let's get started. Um, so first we're gonna talk a little bit about the persistence of anti-Black violence in BIPOC communities. And I wanna really stress that um, during the civil rights era, it wasn't a kumbaya moment. It was actually a very concerted and difficult time where African-Americans and other communities of color, as we'll learn about in the next uh, couple of weeks, were all fighting for social justice, um, but were facing a, a multitude of violence to, trying to keep them in their quote unquote place, right? Um, we'll talk a little bit about the civil rights, movement, civil rights movement itself and what social justice actually looks like. Um, the end of the civil rights era and the rise or the shift to dog whistle politics, civil rights and the war on drugs. Um, and that's gonna be a key time like with the reconstruction era and the rise of Jim Crow, where we actually see a transformation in the race politic um, that gives rise to new systems of oppression that are not necessarily new. And, and I wanna be clear that when I say new, they're emergent in the moment, but they actually still follow a lot of the same logics of previous generations of racism or racial oppression or systemic oppression, whatever, however you wanna conceptualize that. Um, the, uh, the beginning or the rise of police militarization, um, the emergence of modern policing policies, this idea of criminalization, which is gonna be the new way in which we think about race in the United States, why Black Lives Matter, um, some of the central concerns in Black Lives Matter or the Black Lives Matter movement, and then data disparity showing um, the disparate outcomes or the disparate um, effects on um, African Americans within the criminal justice system, which motivated 
um, the formation of, of our kind of Black Lives Matter movement, but also the, the huge movement for, towards racial justice that we've seen in the past couple of years since George Floyd, okay? Um, our key terms today are social justice. And so social justice, as I define it, is going to be justice in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges in, a, in our society. And as we've seen, um, many communities of color have had um, minimal access to a variety of things, safe housing, food, um, uh, voting, education, so on and so forth, all of these in a way that has made it very difficult for them to find, you know, um, socioeconomic success, right? This idea of dog whistle politics, and this may or may not be new to you, um, but you, I'm, I'm sure you have heard of it or have experienced it, especially during the Trump administration, but uh, dog whistle politics is political messaging employing uh, coded language that appears to mean one thing to the general population, but has an additional different and more specific resonance to a targeted subgroup. And so, um, when we think about dog whistle politics, we're thinking about folks saying, build a wall, or um, we don't want to give welfare to individuals. And in doing so, what they're meaning that there's a, a specific community that they want to um, affect. Uh, immigration is probably the most easiest one to note, um, because Illegal immigration is, is discussed in a very ambiguous way, like we don't want to have illegal immigrants here. However, um, most of the conversation about um, border enforcement or immigration enforcement is targeting Latinos and, and or Latinx communities. And so when um, conservative politicians or politicians generally uh, start to mention things about um, the border wall or about immigration um, more generally, uh, they're uh, targeting or discussing this uh, Latinx groups as a specific target. And then the individuals that this is going to resonate the most with is the quote unquote base, right? Which we've heard a lot about in news media today um, is this idea that, that we can discuss race-based politics in a very coded way, have it um, be or have it resonate with, you know, white group, white um, audiences or um, or be targeted at brown communities, um, and so on and so forth. And so uh, there are other examples of this with like gender and those kinds of pieces, but I want to be very clear that you will see many politicians today speak about policy agendas in very neutral or very um, um, sanitized or, you know, kind of um, superficial ways, but really they have this deeper resonance sh showing that um, there is a specific um, ethnic, racial, or, or quote unquote minority group that is the target of the policy or practice that is being, you know, put forward, and that the overall message is actually going more towards their base than the general American population. Okay. Uh, this idea of criminalization. So this is the process by which uh, behaviors are labeled deviant or crimes and individuals are transformed into criminal by those in power. Uh, crime, crime and criminality in the United States, like with race, are social constructs. Um, and they are not, uh, we define what that means over time, right? And so one thing that we want to always note is um, who gets to be a criminal and who doesn't get to be a criminal is always going to uh, be politically, economically, and socially contextual or, or contextualized. Um, uh, for example, um, rape in the United States, uh, especially for married couples, didn't exist until um, very recently. There was no understanding of marital rape, and many women um, could be the targets of um, inter intimate partner violence um, as a result of this kind of lapse in the legal framework. Um, and it wasn't until recently that we, you know, made this concerted effort to actually criminalize that type of behavior. Um, likewise, with drug use, right, we're, we're seeing a shift in the, in the criminality around um, substance uh, possession, use, and abuse, right? Uh, marijuana is still a Schedule One narcotic um, at the federal level and, you know, can wind you up with a pretty nasty felony um, in a federal court if you are convicted for possession. However, many states are taking dramatic steps to decriminalize this. Um, and so what we once saw as this very taboo and, and evil act in our society is now being seen much more as a therapeutic or 
a common recreational substance that doesn't have the um, nefarious implications that it had of the uh, of previous generations, right? Uh, and then lastly, uh, mass incarceration. And sorry, that's a typo, but it says, uh, it should say since 1970, our incarcerated population has increased by 700%, uh, 23 oh, sorry, 2.3 million people are, are in jail and prisons today, far outpacing population growth and crime. Okay, so that's very important for us to think about that although our uh, population growth and crime rate uh, growth has um, uh, slowly increased and actually in the case of crime it's actually decreased um, but our prison population continues to grow despite that number and so what that means is that there is a growing group of people that are being incarcerated um, despite the fact that there isn't enough people in the society or a crime happening to justify that growth in prison populations. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit about uh, the persistence of anti-Black racism. So anti-Blackness persists in our society uh, leading to outbreaks of violence against Black and Brown communities uh, during the kind of pre-civil rights era. So the 1940s becomes a big hot spot for um, specific types of violence. Um, namely, there are uh, ongoing race riots throughout the United States where white mobs are attacking um, various um, African-American communities. And then there was what was called the Zoot Suit Riots, which we'll get more into the weeds on when we get into the Latinx communities. But I wanna do a comparative analysis here. One, because uh, we wanna look at some of the context that were, or some of the, the circumstances that were um, uh, leading to these types of violence. So in Detroit, 1943, there's a massive race riot. Uh, it's right after World War II. Uh, World War II officially ends around 1942. Um, we have a lot of housing shortages. There's an influx of black immigrants from the Great Migration. Remember the Great Migration resumes after 1940. So from 1940 to 1970, we see the second wave of the Great Migration. So again, millions of African-Americans are starting to leave the South, looking for better economic opportunities to escape racism, so on and so forth. Um, in Detroit, uh, race tensions explode at this time. There's um, shortages of work, housing shortages, um, and these existing race tensions. Uh, and then uh, at this time, when this race riot happens, uh, 25 African Americans are killed by white police officers and many more are injured or beaten. Um, what I provided here at the top are two photo examples of white mobs out um, attacking these um, individuals or attacking African Americans, right, in this news headline um, showing this type of massive violence against um, African Americans. Similarly, in Los Angeles or in California, um, the Zutsu riots are starting to happen. Um, it's also around the same time as so around World War II. There are a lot of resource shortages. So at the time we're seeing um, uh, uh, Latinos being criminalized for um, overusing fabric, which was being rationed for World War II. Um, uh, as you know, or, or, or may remember, um, the US government did a concerted effort to um, essentially reserve all kinds of products that were, or all kinds of goods that were to be used in the war effort. Um, I won't get into the, the nitty gritty of, of zoot suits here, but essentially zoot suits were um, very elaborate garments um, that had, ex, uh, that, you know, quote unquote overused fabric. Um, and that presence uh, or the, the garment itself or the, or the dress itself um, uh, became a hot topic for, um, uh, or a hot topic being discussed because it, it was this way in which we could criminalize um, those for their dress um, and their behavior, uh, even though these suits, you know, uh, were not, um, uh, a couple things with the zoot suits was one, Many people who own zoot suits only had a zoot suit. Um, so even though it was a more elaborate garment that had a lot more fabric or or may have used goods that should have been rationed for the war effort, it really wasn't something that was um, outside of like the general norm. There were a lot of people who had 
you know, fancy dress in that time, especially those who were in the um, upper classes. Uh, and mostly what this became a kind of, um, I want to say an a, a ignition point or like that point to start the, the, the race fire in a way uh, on uh, discussing the criminality of, of Mexican Americans who were coming in mass due to um, the Bracero program, which again, we'll talk a little bit later, but the Bracero program in short was a, a concerted effort by the US government to bring Mexican American or Mexicans North to work in agriculture because of the fact that we didn't have farm workers um, largely because many individuals had been drafted to go fight in World War II. And so um, because you had a growing body of Latino immigrants in California, Los Angeles, namely, um, who were flaunting these um, policies of uh, the US government and were already targets of the racial ire that had existed in California and you know, through much of the nation against the Latinx communities for you know, the better part of 100 years, um, we had this kind of tension point that was going, right? Um, and so race tensions explode after a particular instance, which was the Sleepy Lagoon murders. Um, it was a major trial where um, some zoot suitors were tried for murder and convicted, and um, it exploded into this statewide, um, California statewide um, effort to basically beat up Mexicans and um, hundreds uh, hundreds of white uh, police officers and service members, particularly. So these are folks in the armed forces, Navy, Marines, Army, uh, so on and so forth, descended on California to beat up um, uh, Latinos or zoot zooters, essentially, or, or Mexican-Americans at the time. Um, and it was horrific. There were individuals who were stripped of their clothes, as you can see down here in the bottom. These are two zoot suitors. This man's down to his underwear. He was stripped naked in public, beaten. Uh, many of them had their suits burnt, um, had their hair cut, um, so on and so forth. And so during the zoot suit riots, over 150 Latins, as they were described or uh, defined by um, white news media, were beaten by a white service member. Um, and over 500 people were arrested. And I want to highlight this news clipping from the LA Times here, where it says riot alarm sent out for the Zoot War. A servicemen strip and beat 50, uh, 55 uh, use, uh, or I'm sorry, 55 uh, use treated in hospital. Uh, and this again was this kind of uh, um, uh, sense that uh, white folks could basically. Um, uh, a mass and beat up, um, uh, le you know, uh, youth of color or people of color with impunity and not really face any um, uh, consequences for that. And whether it be this or other instances, we constantly see this kind of re uh, uh, replicating pattern where um, there is a immigrant group or there's a minority group in a certain area that uh, becomes, um, you know, too big or, uh, you know, uh, 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 rubs against or, you know, or is against the, or doesn't fit the norm within a certain community. And the response um, by whites is to basically beat them up or, or chase them out of town. And we saw this, uh, if you go back to the previous lecture, in the reconstruction era with that instances of mob violence against African-Americans, um, there were dozens of them throughout much of the South where uh, you had African-Americans, for example, in Tulsa, which was considered to be Black Wall Street, this, this um, kind of Mecca of um, not only Black intelligentsia, so you know, African-Americans who were um, you know, prominent figures in terms of writing and thinking, but also had um, huge um, amounts of wealth in terms of their um, business savvy and entrepreneurship that rubbed against um, the sentiments by uh, whites in the area. And, and as a result, we had a massive race war that happened there where many African-Americans died and, uh, you know, had most of their possessions and, and um, their, most of their possessions and most of their businesses burned to the ground, right? And so we had the emergence of civil rights and social justice at this moment. So um, African-Americans at this time and, and other um, 
social justice movements emerge and had one simple goal, right? This idea of social justice, right? So justice in terms of distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges in a society. Uh, and so uh, these mo movements focused on equality, equity, health, and prosperity, and self-determination for all people. Marginally people and people of color, often the same group of people, right, <clears throat> um, face the following, right? Underserving education, schools that didn't help their you know, children from their community uh, pursue college or better economic possibilities, police, military, law enforcement targeting. Um, uh, this included harassment, brutality, and extra legal violence, as we had seen with, um, excuse me, with um, lynching and so on and so forth. And obviously, the examples of these various race wars and the Zoot Zoot riots. Uh, poor quality housing, living arrangements. Um, all communities were segregated, right? So we talked a little bit about this in terms of education with ethnic cities. Um, so we saw uh, all communities face some kind of segregation. Uh, and, and in the segregation, right, that's also this idea that they don't have access to good schools, they don't have access to good housing, um, uh, and exposure to um, toxins like lead, which have led to uh, um, uh, asthma and certain kinds of cancer unique to you know that type of exposure and then lastly the denial of political rights right uh so this sense of um you know not having access to representatives in government or the ability to vote at the same level as white male citizens and i emphasize white male citizens here because of this idea that white males were the first ones to get the right to vote in the United States, right? So property owning white men are the first ones to get the right to vote in um, the US constitutional framework. And I think that's always gonna be the context or the um, framework that we should um, judge all aspects of um, equality in our society. So another way that we can think about this, um, going back to like the economic disparities when we're, we're covering intersectionality is that white men um, have or make the most money um, in the United States, right? So uh, the compare the comparison or the, the analysis is that uh, white men make, um, you know, one dollar and then all other subgroups make um, a certain percentage of cents to that dollar. So for example, white women make um, roughly about 80 cents uh, to that white man's dollar, right? And then um, uh, African American women make about um, 62 cents, and then Latinas make about 50 cents, right, or 52 cents. Uh, and so that um, uh, disparity creates a condition where um, all other measures start to go down by a certain factor, right? So um, the fact that the overwhelming majority of uh, folks in elected office are white men should be concerning, right? And that should and that should also reflect the way we think about income. So if we think about the, the process to run for office, it's, it's actually very costly, right? So it costs a lot of money to, to run uh, for office. just the sheer fact of all the costs for filing the paperwork and then to get a mass campaign, a campaign, so on and so forth. And so um, with that, uh, when you have a denial of money, you have a denial uh, to political access, right? And so when we think about that in terms of justice system, folks who have money have the ability to hire attorneys, which would give them uh, the ability to get out of jail, right? Or to bail themselves out of jail or whatever that looks like. And so um, uh, we've seen that issue come to fore in terms of the criminal justice system where um, uh, white individuals are able to, uh, you know, circumvent or, uh, you know, I hate to use the term get out of jail free, but the sense that they can get out of jail for issues that they face or, or not face um, consequences for their action. And a good way to think about this is with Harvey Weinstein. Um, you know, Harvey Weinstein, the media mogul, uh, for many, many years had engaged in, you know, sexual assault and sexual harassment of individuals um, and faced no consequences where, you know, uh, a person of lesser standing would face immediate consequences, right, as a result of, of um, their actions. And so, uh, and then likewise with education, right? If you have more money, um, you're able to move to a better neighborhood, which means you can get access to a better school. Or if you live in a 
more depressed neighborhood, you may be able to pay for your child to go to a private school, right? Which will give them better educational opportunities, so on and so forth. So I know that there's a lot of um, simple, simplification in terms of the way in which we think about social justice within these economic terms. But I wanna be very clear that when we've denied individuals um, their, uh, their socioeconomic mobility, it has um, had these ripple effects into other fields where if you, um, you know, get caught for doing something right, you have a greater likelihood of, of punishment, you have, uh, it, you know, your children have less opportunities to go to better schools, which means that intergenerational will be um, harder, or, or the intergenerational mobility will be less than um, you know, and the ability just to get out there and vote or run for office is much more difficult, which all kind of tie together into this sense where we don't really have true justice or social justice for all communities. And, and the reason why, again, I, I mentioned that white male citizen referent is because that was the one or that was the, the category of people that had the most rights at the initial founding of the country, right? And so, we want to be clear that that has been um, the benchmark or the standard by which we've judged justice and equality throughout. And what we've seen is that all other groups that are not white male citizens have not had the same level of equality and opportunity, um, which has led to these other consequences that we're continuously seeing in our society today. So, Um, the civil rights era begins to end um, uh, in the late 1960s, and uh, it also ended the era of overt racism, right, in the political sphere. We had um, new categories of politics start to emerge um, that were evincing a type of race politic that was um, integral to maintaining racial boundaries. Um, originally, the South had two kind of major political parties that wanted to maintain segregation. One was called the Dixiecrats. Um, so if you remember the Mason-Dixon line, which was considered to be the kind of belt away of the South. Um, the Dixiecrats, which were a, a kind of offshoot of the Democratic Party, um, which believed in a type of, of quote unquote liberalism, but liberalism is about the sense of kind of free choice. Um, Dixiecrats were also for free choice, but it was because of this idea that they didn't want government to regulate them um, in, in a way that would hamper their ability to maintain slavery. Dixiecrats and Democrats are different though, okay? And I wanna be very clear, the Democratic Party today, which is a part of a progressive um, politic, has um, advanced uh, racial justice um, and economic justice and gender justice and all of those things um, overwhelmingly for the past, uh, what would be like um, 60 years, right? So we're in 2020. So since the 1960s to today, we've seen um, Democrats and actually a little bit earlier in that because um, FDR was a Democrat uh, and he pushed for a progressive agenda, you know, through the New Deal. So for a little over or close to about a hundred years, we've seen a Democratic Party emerge that has been much more um, socially progressive in its agenda, you know, advancing welfare, labor rights, um, rights for people of color, so on and so forth. But the original iteration of the Democratic Party in the South was a more overtly states' rights and um, segregationist party. However, we actually did have the emergence of a segregationist party. And remember that I had um, uh, put forward that quote by Strom Thurmond, who was um, one of the oldest and longest serving senators in, um, you know, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and so these individuals uh, really put forward a type of um, covertly overt racist, uh, race agenda under this kind of states rights um, policy. The South just needs to be the South and, and embody itself. And there's no way that the government will ever override that. Um, so again, this new class of conservative kind of emerges advocating for states rights and choice as a model of integration. And there were a lot of um, laws in the United States that came out after the civil rights era that attempted to maintain segregation through a couple different avenues. One was to not 
uh, are to deny the uh, desires of communities to go above and beyond what the federal government uh, try to um, put forward in terms of integration. So if the, if the federal government set the benchmarks here and let's say a community in Georgia wanted to go a little bit above and beyond, um, conservatives in that state would say no, essentially balk at that file lawsuits and, and deny those communities' abilities to do so. Um, likewise, we saw a big attack on a lot of integration efforts, namely busing, which was this kind of piecemeal way of, of addressing segregation through schooling um, in the sense that, you know, we could mix up students in different schools and hope for the best. Uh, and I think I may or may not have mentioned this in the education lecture or in the ethnic studies lecture, I should say. Um, but bus failed largely because it was very easy to get parents scared about sending their kids to different schools. Um, because, you know, one thing is with minority parents, if I'm gonna send, my kids away to a school on the other side of the town that is quote unquote better, how do I get to them if I don't have a car or if they, you know, if they're just generally further away, right? It's going to take me longer to go pick my kids up if they're facing some kind of issue. The other thing is um, it's very hard for me to convince white parents to send their kids to poor performing uh, black schools in other areas um, because why would I want to send my kid to the worse school, right? Or the, or the school that isn't as good as the one that they're currently at. And so busing failed almost immediately. And then by the 1970s, we saw a lot of uh, anti-busing legislation um, come to the fore. Uh, actually, President Biden was chastised for this by um, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, who was actually a part of the busing programs in Oakland um, back in the 1970s. Um, President Biden at the time had supported anti-busing legislation under this kind of liberalism ethos of choice. Uh, and uh, California actually had led the way in a lot of ways on this, where by 1972, we'd already um, had uh, propositions passed by voters uh, against busing uh, and then also um, uh, against uh, desegregation orders above and beyond the federal government. And this was kind of a sweeping policy that went across the United States. So that was very um, integral in, in a way in which we saw the emergence of not only this type of politic, this race-based politic, but the end of the civil uh, uh, movement or the, the fallout from civil rights, civil rights legislation that had um, you know, tried to ensure greater access to um, these types uh, or uh, greater access to integration or greater integration. Um, in 1960, uh, President or former President Nixon is elected. And um, when he uh, receives the nomination by the Republican Party at the Republican National Convention in 1968, he's slated by giving a very famous speech where he talks a lot about the forgotten Americans. And um, many scholars and historians note that that um, speech was specifically targeted towards um, white uh, suburbanites who were scared that um, that uh, basically people of color were starting to become unruly. Um, we had seen a lot of protests going on from the 1950s, mid 1950s to then to the late 1960s, where um, you know, uh, African Americans uh, and other communities of color were out in the street, you know, marching for their rights. And as we know, with news media, which never covers things um, holistically, a lot of the news coverage was casting these movements as criminal, right? That these were riots, that these were unreleased individuals. And what Nixon did at the time was capitalize on that kind of fear and say, look, America, this isn't who you are. We are better than this. And these individuals are bad and you are good. And therefore, um, you know, we should uh, advance a new political agenda that will bring us back to the, to the um, good old days, right? Or in, you know, more common terms that we've seen today um, from the last presidency, this idea of quote unquote, make America great again. And, um, I want to be very clear that Trump's Make America Great policy, although very uh, overtly racist and, and, and very um, uh, or advancing a type of race politic in and of itself, is not necessarily new, but rather something that we saw with um, both of the Bushes, um, with 
uh, Nixon, with Reagan and other types of conservatives who try to um, uh, call or, or bring in um, voters under this uh, idea that we can go back to a time in America where things were better. Um, although, you know, as many scholars of color and, and progressive scholars have noted, that time that we think about when America was great was actually when it wasn't at its best, right? These were the times of segregation, these were the times of racial violence, so on and so forth. Or this assumption that, you know, uh, where we are today is not great because, you know, we are a bit more progressive or we've uh, advanced more policies that have been more supportive of marginalized communities or minoritized communities. And so this point in 1968 is where we actually see the shift or the sudden, this rise of the Sutter strategy, which gave rise to what were called dog whistle politics. And um, the video clip I'm going to show here from the nation with Lee Atwater. So Lee Atwater was a campaign uh, manager for Nixon in 1968. And he's interviewed shortly after um, Nixon is elected. Um, and he discusses what the Southern strategy is and what it, what was his actual intention. And I want you to be, I want you to listen very carefully to what Lee is mentioning here, because he actually shows how this is actually linking to race and what the Southern strategy, which was again, enunciated by Reagan, enunciated by the Bushes, enunciated by uh, President Trump and his Make America Great program is talking about race without actually saying race itself. Here's how I would approach that issue as a, as a, as a statistician or a political scientist, or no, as a psychologist, which I'm not, is, is how abstract you, you handle the race thing. In other words, you start out, and, and now y'all are quoting me. You start out in 1954 by saying nigger, nigger, nigger. By 1968, you can't say nigger. That hurts your backfire, so you say stuff like uh, force busing states rights and all that stuff and you get so abstract now you're talking about cutting taxes and all of these things you're talking about are totally economic things and the byproduct of it is blacks get hurt worse than white and subconsciously maybe that is part of it i'm not saying that but i'm saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded uh that, that we're, that we're doing away with the racial problem one way or the other uh, you follow me because obviously sitting around saying uh, we want to cut taxes, we want to cut this, and we want is much more abstract than, than even the busing thing. Uh, and a hell of a lot more abstract than never did, you know. So I, any way you look at it, race is coming on the back burner. Yeah. So what Lee is mentioning here, and, and this is where I want to be very clear today that we've seen this a lot with politics, and the discussion of um, race in uh, legislation and policy initiatives is, um, for example, with the Trump tax agenda uh, or the Trump tax cuts that were passed uh, midway in his administration pre-pandemic, um, there was a lot of conversation about these being for Americans. And none of the data in terms of tax cuts from the Trump administration from the Bush era, from the Reagan era, ever bore out benefits towards communities of color. And they've always benefited um, corporations, right? And if we know, or if we consider who are in power in these, in these spaces, it's always white folks, right? So white CEOs uh, generally tend to benefit more or white you know, entrepreneurs, uh, so on and so forth. And where other policies around like, Mr. Atwater, I mentioned, or as Lee mentioned, states' rights pieces about busing, about housing, um, about other things um, start to abstract the conversation about race. So, for example, if I say I don't want to give more um, housing credits towards certain groups, right, or just more housing credits, what they're saying is that I don't want to give more opportunities to people of color who are generally poorer or, or 
less wealthy than whites in the United States. And so I'm not saying that I'm going to deny housing or housing benefits to these communities. I'm just going to say that I'm not going to uh, continue this program, maybe because it's not fiscally sound or whatever that looks like. And what the effect is, is that we are going to have um, less opportunities for communities of color. Uh, this actually connects a lot to today. And, and as you all know, I've, I've worked uh, concertedly on the efforts of uh, advancing ethnic studies in K-12 schools. Um, a lot of the pushback against um, uh, teaching ethnic studies in high schools or in, in K-12 schools and in higher education by extension has been about trying to teach American values versus um, speaking towards a specific ethnic and racial communities, right? And this is what we saw with Tom Horn and John Huppenthal in the um, precious knowledge case, right? Let's focus on Americanism versus, you know, teaching towards a specific culture or community. What you're saying in that moment is that I don't want to teach the full and true history of the United States, which makes certain communities, namely whites, look bad, or I don't want to have specific programs that will benefit communities of color. I'm going to advance an American agenda uh, and not talk about race, but the fact is that the way education is taught today is actually dispro disproportionately impacting students of color, right? And so we, we are able to move around the race issue by saying, we're going to, you know, not do these things that are, are fiscally unsound, or I'm not going to go away from American values. Rather, I'm only going to focus on, uh, you know, teaching this one way or doing this one type of policy, which seems race neutral on the surface, but really has um, direct race effects uh, in practice, right? And so um, the civil rights movement brought about equality to various US populations, particularly people of color. However, racism at the time or at this time evolved into something much more uh, from something uh, much more explicit to something more covert, right? And we saw this with Mr. Atwater's um, discussion or interview. Uh, presidents employed this kind of Southern strategy to so solidify white separatism and change the race politic, right? Keep your kids away from dangerous drugs and criminals rather than blacks or Mexicans. And <clears throat> what the drug war did, and, and that's why I wanted to have you read both uh, Michelle Alexander's piece on the new Jim Crow and the the article by um, uh, Alicia Garza on Black Lives Matter is um, what we've seen with policies today and what we've seen, especially with media coverage today, is this construction of various communities as other um, based on these very superficial markers, which again are still tied to race, but don't really discuss race explicitly. Um, one way to think about this is with um, Latinos is, again, this construction of illegal immigrants, right? That illegal, illegal immigrants are bad, that they're going to destroy the culture, the community, that they're taking jobs and resources, so on and forth, that are going to hinder American progress. Although we know, by and large, many um, industries rely heavily on, on labor from immigrants, specifically undocumented immigrants, because one, um, undocumented immigrants work for less, right? So companies can make more money because at, right, so they need those workers to yeah, increase their profit margin. Um, and two, there are a lot of jobs in the United States that American citizens don't want to do, and and so we have to rely on immigrant labor to be able to do that. Um, we can, uh, and and the construction of illegal immigrants as other creates the conditions where um, we can ostracize and keep ourselves separated from them uh, and deport them whenever we want um, because of their non-citizen status. Likewise, with African Americans, the construction of their criminality by race um, <clears throat> creates a condition where we're not talking about folks anymore, but we're saying that we don't want these drug dealers or bad people around our, our kids, right? And um, you may or may not have experienced this. I did a lot when I was like uh, when I was smaller, when I was younger. Uh, but there was a lot of conversation about drug use and badness and wanting to basically lock everybody up who did drugs or deal drugs um, because they were going to harm your children. Um, and this was a, a great 
kind of re envisionment of an old strategy to get um, whites and suburbanites scared of um, people of color after the reconstruction era. And we saw this um, in the video on the black codes, whereas this kind of overwhelming focus on black criminality showing that uh, you know, the, uh, the emancipation of Blacks was bad because now we had this class of unruly criminals through our society that we needed to be worried about. And um, uh, this was so prominent that the very first movie ever to be shown in the White House, which was the, um, uh, I'm sorry, Birth of a Nation, uh, which was based on a, upon a novel celebrating the Ku Klux Klan, the emphasis of that movie uh, was uh, or the the plot of the movie was how um, escaped black criminal was going to um, basically chase down and rape this white woman. Um, and at the end of the movie, she basically uh, kills herself rather than being subjected to the, to, you know, sexual assault by this black man. The black man in the movie is not technically black. It's a white man in black face. Um, and the, the crux of this movie and the reason why it's important to kind of emphasize it here is that the media constructs this idea of, of people of color, deviance or criminality. Um, and in doing so, it doubles down on these, these thought processes of race that these individuals are bad um, because of their sociality, right? They're these, these social um, uh, aspects of their, of their selves, right? Or their, or their personhood. And because they are bad or deviant, so on and so forth, we need to, we need to, control them or lock them up, right? And so uh, we think about this with drug policing today. Do we always police drugs and stuff like that as we do? And, and frankly, we did not. You could buy heroin, you could buy methamphetamine, you could buy cocaine, um, you could buy marijuana um, you know, in drug stores throughout much of the United States around the turn of the 20th century. If you're familiar with the history of Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola actually had cocaine in it originally. Uh, and many um, uh, soda products, um, especially dark soda pro products actually had, um, cocaine in it. And cocaine was just kind of a common drug that many people use. It wasn't until much later that we started to criminalize it more. Um, and there's a great documentary. I'll show a small clip of it in this lecture here, um, called the house I live in where, um, Eugene Jarecki and, um, some of the folks that he features in the documentary discuss specifically how, um, the criminalization of certain drugs, namely opium, cocaine, and marijuana was tied to anti-immigrant and anti-people of color sentiments. Um, the criminalization of opium was targeting um, uh, Chinese Americans, which I'll talk a little bit about when we get into our Asian Americans in the US context. Um, uh, cocaine was uh, criminalized to target African Americans and uh, cannabis, which is, was transformed into marijuana, was uh, criminalized to target Latinos. And so when Nixon comes into office around the 1970s, we see the beginning of mass incarceration, right? So in 1971, he, he declares a quote unquote war on drugs. And we see this exponential increase in uh, mass incarceration where um, we have millions of people who get, um, uh, entrapped in the, in the law enforcement of the criminal justice apparatus. Um, and so the US male incarceration rate increased by almost fivefold. And of this, um, it's mostly African Americans, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, additionally, uh, around this time, we see the increase of police militarization. So both mass incarceration and police militarization happened simultaneously. So um, one of the ways that we were actually able to, again, you know, further this system of racism was through um, increasing this emphasis on law enforcement and, and criminal justice. And like with the convict leasing system, mass incarceration becomes the new face of this system. So we had chattel slavery, then we have, um, we have, uh, I'm sorry, the convict leasing system, Jim Crow and the Black Codes, and then that transforms into the system of mass incarceration. And so, um, Police militarization goes hand in hand with this, where we have um, police officers transform from this kind of hokey individual with a six shooter on his hip to this massive, uh, massively armed individual with 
um, you know, rifles, uh, grenade launchers, um, so on and so forth, and actually governmental programs that it allowed for um, police to be trained like military personnel um, so that way they could execute um, drug interdiction or drug enforcement um, and uh, arrest people in huge droves. So I wanted to show this quick video clip on the history of police militarization, and then I'll talk a little bit more about mass incarceration. When we have major snow blizzards, <laughs> we have major snow blizzards, like I think it was like a few years ago. We had the military ride through the streets with guns. They sit on top of the gun. We know the trucks and stuff with guns, sitting, looking out the window with guns, riding through the big trucks and stuff in the back with guns, like we're at war, you know? But it was just, no, it was just snow outside. You're just trying to make, protect people and keep it clear. You know, it's just, I think it was just like a, a threat, like a scare, just a scare, you know? If the guns in the military were just something to scare the people, you know? We don't, we don't hear no incident. You never heard an incident of when the military had to be involved in something within the United States and they had to take out force. You know, we never, you never hear anything about that. You know, and it's something you ain't, you can't cover up nowadays. The term police militarization involves the use of military equipment and tactics by the law enforcement officers. This includes the use of armored personnel carriers, assault rifles, submachine guns, grenades, grenade launchers, sniper rifles, and the SWAT team. If you want to talk about uh, police militarization, most people start looking uh, back in the 1970s. And that's really when we start to see the acceleration of police militarization. But in order to actually understand how we get to that point, we have to actually go back a little bit further. So if you look at the Constitution of the US, and if you look at laws that were passed in subsequent years, uh, you see that the founders had a very keen understanding of what we refer to as the paradox of government power. And that is the idea that anytime you give the government enough power uh, to do something, you are entrusting them to do whatever uh, that activity is, but you're also trusting them to not abuse that power. And so from that, it's, the idea is that you need to come up with a way to constrain the government so that they don't abuse those powers. And one of the things that the founders did was they separated very purposefully the functions of the military from the functions of the domestic police. And they wrote into law that the military could not actually be used as a domestic police force. But we start to see that over time, this, uh, this separation of these two groups, uh, it starts to become particularly blurry. Experts say there's a long history of militarization of the police dating back to the race riots that broke out in a handful of U.S. cities in the 1950s and 60s. Keep on riding until they stop on riding. But where we really start to see police militarization accelerate um, to the degree that we see it today really begins with the war on drugs and the war on terror. And the reason those two events are particularly important, um, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that they both represent major crisis points in U.S. history. Uh, whether we want to think that they were actually crises or whether or not they were just perceived doesn't actually uh, matter. But the idea behind a crisis is that you have some major event and then people freak out. So there's this call for the government to do, do something to combat, in this case, illegal drugs or terrorism. So the war on drugs officially starts in the 1970s. So I think it's in 1971, Richard Nixon officially declares the war on drugs. And at this point, you start to see essays, other kinds of uh, ad campaigns talking about things like the epidemic of crack babies. Um, and basically people start freaking out that illegal drugs are going to completely erode American society, it's going to destroy the American youth, and that drugs are just going to be basically the end of the world. And as a result, going back to the economics of the crisis, they call upon the government to do something. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize for you the 
meeting that I have just had with bipartisan leaders, America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. 1981, you see the passage of the Military Cooperation with Law Enforcement Act, which allows the Department of Defense to share information with local law enforcement, it allows them to share uh, tactical information, and also allows them to share uh, weapons with police departments, as well as maintain these weapons. Uh, along with that program, uh, you have program 1033, which was issued by the Department of Defense. This allows for the transfer of old military equipment uh, to local police departments. There's another program called 1122, which allows for the transfer of new equipment. And this doesn't just include things like, uh, you know, bulletproof vests or uh, helmets, which is some of it, but it also includes things like uh, high-powered assault rifles, uh, grenade launchers, tanks, aircraft, those kinds of things. Since the 1970s, riot police have fired at protesters using guns or rubber bullets or plastic bullets, which were invented by the British Ministry of Defense in 1970 for the use during the trouble riots. Tear gas, which was developed for riot control in 1919 by the U.S. Army's Chemical Warfare Service, is widely used against the protesters of today. The use of tear gas in warfare is prohibited by various international treaties that most states have signed. However, it's law enforcement or military use for domestic or non-combat situations, which is permitted. I think that repealing things like the 1032 program, like the 1122 program, are good places to start. Um, what I think will probably happen with the executive order, at least based on what I've read so far, is that the, the, the rhetoric that Obama and others are using is that, well, this is clearly a problem. We need to make sure that the police departments who are using this equipment have a quote unquote good reason for using this equipment, which is basically, um, it's basically doing exactly what we've done before because the police departments who have this equipment for these programs, they've already supposedly justified why it is that they need these things for either drug interdiction purposes, for counterterrorism purposes, that's the quote unquote good reason that they've given. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's potentially a first step. Um, I think that repealing those programs is maybe something uh, that we could do. In terms of a long-term solution to this problem, I think that it's a lot more complex because I think you're fighting a lot of different battles at once. So at a bare minimum, you have to have a massive shift in public opinion that police militarization is a serious problem and is something that needs to be corrected. I think that's a pretty big assumption in and of itself. But more than that, even if you do have a large shift in public opinion, the other thing that you have to combat is a massive, uh, you have to co combat this massive, uh, a terror, massive terrorism complex and a massive uh, drug complex. So you have a lot of um, parties who are particularly interested in keeping these kinds of things going. Police departments who get a lot of their funding from saying that they're doing drug, inter they're counteracting drugs or they're counteracting terrorism, they're not gonna want these programs to go away because it's a large portion. And in some cases, it's the majority of where their funding comes from. They don't want that to go away. Um, if you start making reforms to the system, you have uh, other groups. So all of the people who are manufacturing these different weapons that are going to the military and then to the police, um, they have an interest in keeping these kinds of things going. And in terms of how you how you untangle uh, that that web, if you will, after it's gone on for so long, um, I don't think I have a a very clean a very clean solution. But I think that definitely the having having people recognize outright that this is a problem and it is a systematic problem is really fundamental in starting to, to reverse the tide.
And so as Professor Hall mentions, and as we've kind of seen here, and I've, I've shown this kind of teleology of what policing looks like in the US. So from this kind of, um, you know, colonialist person with a, a musket gun all the way up to a police officer, right? And the, the amounts of money spent uh, millions of dollars for a variety of different, um, you know, vehicles uh, and different equipment. This new system of, you know, racial entrapment or, or racism uh, through mass incarceration is huge. Uh, it is, we're going to see this more in a second in terms of the prison population, but of this concerted effort to expand um, policing and, and criminalization in the United States is, is huge in terms of the shift in race. And like with convict leasing until slavery, right? These were massive programs, massive systems that um, interred or, you know, captured uh, large amounts of people um, that had huge amounts of dollar signs attached to it uh, and became, you know, um, very economically addictive, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, to the society in that, you know, we don't, you know, police officers today will always say that they need this type of equipment to do their jobs. Um, communities will say that we need these types of programs to keep our our, our, our community safe. Um, you know, like we had with yesterday where we said, you know, we needed to have um, African-Americans enslaved because that was, you know, their lot or that was, you know, what was, you know, their, their destiny in life. And we couldn't have them uh, mixed with communities because it would be a, make them unsafe. Um, after, you know, emancipation, similarly with convict leasing, this same kind of logic emerged. Um, and what it led to was these huge disparities in terms of, you know, obviously communities of color and African-Americans being, you know, incarcerated, right? So um, we have this new system of policing that emerges as a result of this. Um, so we have the rise of mass policing and mass incarceration systems um, and a particular shift, right, in policing theory. Um, originally, officers were seen as peace officers charged with making communities peaceful. But in the post-Reagan and the post-Nixon era, we see this shift to what was called broken windows policing. And so broken windows policing emerged uh, from... Uh, Bill Bratton, he was a, a law enforcement chief in New York City. He moved to LA and then moved back and essentially argued that the way to stop crime in the United States or, or rampant crime was to arrest every low level offender. And then eventually there would be no um, grunts you know, for uh, bosses essentially to, uh, or crime bosses to have to do their work, right? Like cut the tentacles off of the, of the octopus essentially, you know, it won't have a leg to stay on it, or, or cut, you know, saw the legs off a chair and, and the leg won't be able to stand up. What this led to was, you know, huge amounts of arrests and fines levied against uh, poor people, again, mostly people of color, right? Uh, and uh, an emphasis on this low level policing where major crimes like murder, rape, and so on and so forth were not adjudicated at similar rates uh, or even investigated. And so, this shift towards drug policing created this large apparatus of drug interdiction, which had millions and billions of dollars invested in it. And um, the types of crimes that are, are much more harmful, economic white collar crimes and interpersonal crimes were not emphasized as much, right? Um, and now we see, again, this you know emphasis on low level crime uh, and crime ridden areas. Uh, but there's a couple things that we have to keep in mind with this. One is that um, when you constantly arrest low level crime areas, right, that that gives this sense that there is a lot of crime, right? Because you can say high crime areas, but you don't stress what type of crime it is. You just say crime. Um, and secondarily, um, uh, the emphasis on crime and the emphasis on criminality in a certain area creates a self-fulfilling prophecy. And we saw this a lot with stop and frisk, and we're still seeing it today, where the discussion is on crime in these areas. Uh, and there's, you know, numbers, quote unquote, to back it up. But when you're only looking in certain areas, and you're constantly picking people up, sometimes not even for real offenses or for minimal offenses, what it shows us is yes, yes, there is high crime, but we don't know if there's crime in other areas, because we're not stressing it there. And 
also if there's such an emphasis on policing there and it's still unsafe there's going to be an issue right like why would i invest billions of dollars to stop crime in an area where the crime keeps happening right that that wouldn't make sense because you would assume at some point that crime should stop right uh however uh there's if there's constantly crime in an area no matter how much money in law enforcement you throw at it then there's probably going to be either an issue with the way in which the data is being collected or the crime is being reported and or um we uh uh the the individuals who are constantly um uh picking people up for criminal offenses are probably doing so because they're being incentivized to do so and and that's what we see with the conversation from Professor Hall is this idea that um, you know drug interdiction is so prominent and so self-fulfilling that um, individuals are gonna constantly say that there's crime and other things happening in these areas because it's an easy way for them to justify the continuance of their funding, right? Um, you know, criminal uh, policing in the United States should be something where it comes to an end, right? We should try to find an, er a, an uh, a situation of social stability where we don't have crime anymore. However, if there's a lot of crime happening in a particular area, there's probably something going on in terms of either the way policing is happening or um, the way the data is being reporting, right? And so this leads us to this idea of criminalization. Uh, criminalization, like with race, is the process by which behavior um, criminalization is the process by which behaviors are labeled deviant or crimes and individuals are transformed uh, into criminals by those in power. And again, I want to be very clear that criminalization is a process of social construction, like with um, race. They're very, they're, uh, they have all of the same kind of tenets in terms of how we see them come to the fore, right? So it's culturally and politically defined and often used to target and remove unwanted communities. Um, like with racialization, criminalization um, is a process by which we make people seem like they're criminals and we remove them um, because of that, right? We arrest them, lock them up, so on and so forth. There are normal transgressions that we would assume in society, right? Like assault, murder, so on and so forth. The problem is, and as we're going to see with some of the data that I'm going to present here, is that there are clear disparities in who gets arrested for what, right? And because the the multitude of people who are being arrested are people of color and spending more time in jail and the, the overwhelming presence of people of color in prisons in the united states again harken back to the idea that one in three black men will be incarcerated in their lifetime and one in six uh latinx men will be um incarcerated in their lifetime compared to one in 13 white men being incarcerated in their lifetime shows us that uh people of color are uh, overwhelmingly the targets of the system and being removed more so because uh, mostly I would argue because of their race rather than the actual behaviors that are happening, right? So criminalized communities are part of a long history of dominant groups racializing minorities to either re-enslave them or remove them. This clip from uh, the house I live in that I mentioned earlier will really show how this has borne out historically. Yeah, let's say it this way because it's more honest. Instead of saying, Let's get rid of all these drug addicts and drug drug dealers, and 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 once we put throw away the key on them, we'll we'll solve this problem. Why don't you try saying it to yourself this way? All these Americans that we don't need anymore, the factories are closed. We don't need them. You know, the textile mills they're gone. GM is closing plants. We don't need these people. They're extra extra Americans. We don't need them. Let's just get rid of the bottom fifteen percent of the country. Let's lock them up. In fact, let's see if we can make money off locking them up in the short term even though it's gonna be an incredible burden for our society, even though it's gonna destroy these families, you know, where these people are, are probably integral to the lives of other Americans, let's just get rid of them. You know, I mean, if, at that point, why don't you just say kill the poor? If we kill the poor, we're gonna be a lot better off because that's what the drug wars become. My father was a war crimes investigator in Europe after World War II. And we often talked about his experiences. I was reading the work of Raoul Hilberg, who wrote about the destruction of European Jews and the Holocaust. We've long known that the process of destruction was an undertaking step by step. I realized 
that there was a chain of destruction, that what he was talking about could be expressed by links in a chain around the world in more than one society. People do the same things again and again, decade after decade, century after century. Now this chain of destruction begins with the phase we can call identification in which the group of people is identified as a cause for problems in society. People start to perceive their fellow citizens as bad, they're evil. They used to be worthwhile people, but now all of a sudden, for some reason, their lives are worthless. The second link in the chain of destruction is ostracism, by which we learn how to people, how to take their jobs away, how to make it harder for them to survive. People lose their place to live. Often they're forced into ghettos where they're physically isolated, separate from the rest of society. The third link is confiscation. People lose their rights, civil liberties. The laws themselves change, so it's made easier for people to be stopped on the street, patted down, searched, and for their property to be confiscated. Now, once you start taking people's property away, you can start taking the people themselves away. And the fourth link is concentration concentrate them into facilities such as prisons, camps. People lose their rights. They can't vote anymore, they have children anymore. Often their labor is exploited in a very systematic form. And the final link in the chain of destruction is annihilation. Now this might be indirect by say withholding medical care, withholding food, preventing further birth, or it might be direct where death is inflicted or people are deliberately killed. These steps tend to happen on their own momentum, without anybody forcing them to happen. I think a lot of people would be disturbed and outraged by the thought that any part of this process could be going on in America. But it wasn't until I began studying the drug war that I realized that some of these same steps were happening. For instance, identification. All of us agree that the gravest domestic threat facing our nation today is drugs. The way to take a problem and make it a huge problem is first you ask the wrong question and then you feed us the wrong answer. Who's responsible? Let me tell you straight out. Everyone who uses drugs, everyone who sells drugs, and everyone who looks the other way. You identify people, their characteristics. You make them other using fear-mongering as if they're the cause of our problems. These people are killing our kids. These people are disrupting society. These people are wrecking our society. Secondly, ostracism. Society learns to hate drug users. If you're a casual drug user, you're an accomplice to murder. You apply special laws to them that don't apply to others. Now, all of a sudden, these people who've previously just been identified as drug users become criminals. If you break the law, you no longer have a home in public housing. The ultimate effect is isolation, being cut off from mainstream society. We started out, we identify them, we figure out who they are, then we start making laws to prevent them from being around our children. You push them out of the places where they may be successful, and so where do they go? The area of the least opposition, the modern American ghetto. We manage to isolate the poor economically. You force them out of the place where they could live and work and possibly be successful, and now you make them, you make them criminals. So once the economics has done its business, then you can have different levels of policing. You can you can change the rules. You got a bench warrant, probably for drugs. Hey guys, you know the program. Get the hands up, turn around. Confiscation. Any property they find on you can be subjected to civil forfeiture. The money's ours now. That's my money now. Federal and local police seize these vehicles after their occupants allegedly purchased cocaine and other drugs. If we're seizing their property, it's really a simple next step to start seizing their persons. Holloway was arrested on charges of resisting arrest and wandering with the intent to buy drugs. In the drug war, there's more that's being confiscated. Okay. It's being taken from them is all hope in a future. What y'all getting them for? The war, we told you, was the narcotics. With the drug war, we've gone as far as the concentration phase. My government says we're fighting a heroic war against drugs and the war against people who use drugs. And frankly, a lot of them are just going to have to be locked up. 
extraordinary numbers of people are in prison because of drugs, yet it is not a place to get drug treatment. They come out, and then we're surprised that we have the highest recidivism rates, and that results in this cycle of incarceration and overcrowding. This concentration of people, whether it's in inner city ghettos or in prisons, creates a culture of hopelessness that is incredibly corrosive. When they don't have any prospects, people turn to drugs. And then we'll pursue them, and we'll be able to hire a bunch of prison guards and parole officers and narcotics detectives and drug treatment people. In the short term, uh, some people have jobs. Annihilation. That's not happening with the drug war in this country. But there are subtle but real ways that don't involve indiscriminate mass killings, such as preventing births. $200 cash payments to women addicted to crack to be sterilized. Violence in prisons. Severe overcrowding sparked jailhouse riots. 27 inmates died yesterday. People swept up in drug war violence. 140 drug killings this year. An Iraqi war veteran was killed after SWAT team officers stormed his Tucson, Arizona home in a drug raid that turned up no drugs. Now, it's important to remember or to realize it isn't that the war on drug users is the same as what happened in other societies, but that both are wars on ordinary people, people who are just like us. You've got to have an enemy for everything. The way that uh, Germany in the 30s rebuilt their infrastructure, rebuilt their their industries and rebuilt their pride, their nationalism, was by saying that these people, this group of people, is the cause of all of our woe. And if we hate them, we'll be better off. And that apt statement, I think, is what we can see with the rise of new racism through criminalization, right? We no longer hate people of color. We accept them but we don't like criminals. And so what we do is we say all of these people who we originally hated are now criminals. And that gives us a new framework to create a gigantic apparatus, like with convict leasing, right? To hate an individual group and then inter them based on these social categories, which again, socially constructed and then inexorably are tied to race, right? And so, That leads us to why Black Lives Matter. These were their last words. Their names define a movement. Their deaths a rallying cry for justice. The killing of George Floyd has protested demanding change, led by Black Lives Matter once again. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. Black Lives Matter group has been fighting to be heard since 2013. And the phrase itself is now being seen on streets and screens all over the world. But how did the movement get here? How did it begin? Their message comes from an urgent need to tackle police brutality. And the statistics are stark. Police killed more than a thousand people in America in 2019. Black people are currently three times more likely to be killed by police. And 99% of killings by a police officer between 2013 to 2019 have not resulted in criminal charges. But the Black Lives Matter bubble didn't actually start with police brutality. It began after the death of Trayvon Martin at the hands of an armed vigilante. It is a story that no one can stop talking about, the shooting of Trayvon Martin. On a February evening in 2012 in Sanford, Florida, Neighborhood Watch volunteer George Zimmerman called the police to report a suspicious person. This guy looks like he's up to no good or he's on drugs or something. It's raining and he's just walking around looking about. Okay, and this guy, is he white, black, or Hispanic? He looks black. He's told not to approach the person in question. Are you following him? Yeah, okay, we don't need you to do that. Zimmerman ignored the instructions and started following 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Moments later, neighbors reported hearing gunfire. Gunshot. 
You just heard gunshots? Yes. How many? This one. Zimmerman accepted he shot Martin, claiming self-defense. He wasn't immediately charged. In fact, it took 44 days for him to be arrested, only after national media attention, a petition signed by more than a million people, and a public response from the then president. You know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. We're going to get to the bottom of exactly what happened. A year later, Zimmerman was found not guilty of all charges by a jury of six women, five of them white. The acquittal caused outrage and sparked the birth of a new kind of civil rights movement. Long before there was a Black Lives Matter movement, there was a movement for Black Lives. It comes as a great shock to discover that the country, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity, has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. BLM from its beginning was the continuation of a tradition. Uh, and a remix of a much longer Black freedom struggle, but it has its roots uh, in the labor of Black women. After Zimmerman's acquittal, activist Alicia Garza posted on Facebook, Black people, I love you. I love us. Our lives matter. Black lives matter. Garza's friend Patrice Collure shared the final three words as a hashtag. On the 7th of March 2013, Black Lives Matter was first seen on Twitter. Writer and immigrant rights activist Opal Tometi offered to build social media platforms for it, where activists could connect with one another. With this hashtag, new conversations were being created online and ultimately uh, in our everyday lives. Black Lives Matter is our call to action. It is a tool to reimagine a world where Black people are free to exist free to live. It is a tool for our allies to show up differently for us. The movement gained popularity in the summer of 2014. Ghana's last words, now a rally, I can't breathe, caught on video. The incident went viral. In July 2014, on a street in New York, Staten Island, 43-year-old Ghana was arrested on suspicion of illegally selling cigarettes. I did nothing. We sit here the whole time. I love this. He died in a confrontation with Officer Daniel Pantaleo after being placed in a chokehold. He was the father of six. Pantaleo was fired five years later, but a state grand jury still refused to press criminal charges. Black lives do not matter to this system. When you, time and time again, you're seeing us being murdered, and time and time again, you're seeing the police go free. Just two months after Eric Garner's death, another fatal shooting. There is growing outrage tonight after an unarmed African-American teenager was shot and killed by police in the St. Louis suburb of Ferguson, Missouri. 18-year-old Michael Brown allegedly stole a pack of cigarellos from a corner store. Police officer Darren Wilson shot Brown after suspecting him of being involved in the robbery. Police have shot this man for no reason. Brown was due to start college two days after he was killed. For weeks, hundreds of people who'd never taken part in organized protests before took to the streets. Hands up! Don't shoot! More tear gas, more rubber bullets, anger boiled over. Ferguson's governor called in the National Guard. Black Lives Matter was used on Twitter over 50,000 times a day. Despite the anger surrounding the case, Darren Wilson wasn't prosecuted. He resigned from the force and said he acted in self-defense. Ferguson and Michael Brown Jr. will be a defining moment on how this country deals with police. After Ferguson, the Black Lives Matter movement took root and gained momentum as black people continued to die at the hands of white police. It was a cycle of killings, protests, and no, no criminal, criminal charges. charges. No federal charges, no state criminal charges. This was all happening with America's first black president and attorney general at the helm. I chose to run for president at this moment in history because I believe deeply that we cannot solve the challenges of our time unless we solve them together. Racial discrimination has been around since the founding of this country. To ask that the first Black president fix that is asking too much. This is lawyer Roy Austin. He worked in the White House as deputy assistant to President Obama in the Office of Urban Affairs, Justice and Opportunity. We took a, a ton of steps uh, under very difficult circumstances because there was this narrative that we were anti-police for taking these steps. Some of the steps taken under Obama included 
issuing consent decrees. These allow the court to overhaul police departments accused of civil rights abuses, putting limits on the ability of local police forces to have military grade weapons and more pattern and practice investigations into police departments. So where are they using excessive force repeatedly? Where are they engaging in discriminatory policing repeatedly? Activists at the time thought the administration should have been doing more to dismantle systems in place that were protecting the police. Qualified immunity is a legal doctrine that essentially shields police um, from, from persecution uh, or legal uh, retribution. Police officers are protected by union contracts, which make it very difficult for them to be fired. Police officers have an all too cozy relationship with district attorneys. All these ingredients taken together create a culture where police officers are licensed to kill and almost always get away with it. No justice! No justice! So even though Black Lives Matter representatives were invited to the Obama White House, they were also some of its harshest critics. So their idea was, yes, show up, yes, be at the table. But if you don't get the kind of policy responses that you demand, then flip that table. And then the table flipped totally in 2016. Well, you see them marching and you see them on occasion, at least, I've seen it, where they're essentially calling death to the police. And that's not acceptable. In the years running up to the 2016 election, Black Lives Matter faced a backlash. Some started using the slogans, all lives matter, white lives matter, and blue lives matter in response. When you say black lives matter, that's inherently racist. Well, I think there are- Black arguing... lives matter, white lives matter, Asian lives matter, Hispanic lives matter. That's anti-American and it's racist. America's police and law enforcement personnel are what separates civilization from total chaos. I am the law and order mm -hmm. candidate. Donald Trump's then election marks a new era for America and the world. The summer after the inauguration, racial tensions inflamed again. <laughs> Last night's torchlight protest march by the alt-right in Charlottesville, Virginia, has eerie echoes of the past. Violence unfolded as white nationalists clashed with counter-protesters. A car accelerated into the crowd, killing a woman and leaving five others critically injured. President Trump failed to immediately call out the white supremacists. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides, on many sides. The following year, violent hate crime in the state hit a 16 year high. Killings of black people at the hands of white police continued. It just barely made the news. Donald Trump essentially sucked all the life and oxygen out of the media. Black Lives Matter was no longer, you know, the lead story. Many Americans were also enjoying the relative calm of a booming economy. African-Americans had a record low unemployment rate of 5.4% in August 2019. That shows his support for the black community. When the president says, I understand, I hear you, the president has people around him that look like me who get what's happening. At the beginning of 2020, US election year, echoes of 2012 and 2013 hit the headlines again. Public outcry at the actions of vigilantes and a video gone viral. We turn now to the case of Ahmaud Arbery, the unarmed African-American man who was shot and killed while out for a jog in his Georgia neighborhood. I thought that Ahmaud's story would open the eyes of the, of the leaders. I thought maybe it was losing Ahmaud, it would help. By the 21st of May, the men involved in the killing had been arrested and faced murder charges. But in less than a month after Arbery's death, Breonna Taylor was fatally shot by police in her own apartment in Louisville, Kentucky. No one was immediately arrested. In June, the FBI reopened an investigation. Breonna Taylor was an emergency room technician, yet her killing slipped largely under the radar as COVID-19 swept the US, disproportionately affecting communities of color. I and many Black Americans are at higher risk for COVID. Coronavirus is killing more African Americans. African Americans bear the brunt of the economic downturn brought on by the coronavirus. In Minneapolis, Minnesota, 46-year-old George Floyd was victim to these conditions. He'd lost his restaurant job 
and tested positive for COVID-19. Suspecting Floyd of using a forged $20 bill, police officer Derek Chauvin held his knee on his neck for several minutes. The world watched and started speaking out. No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! No justice, no peace! Certainly, with 40 million people unemployed, 100,000 uh, Americans dead, um, a white nationalist in office, and then a, a televised public lynching, those are certainly the perfect conditions for the emergence of rebellion. All four police officers involved in Floyd's killing were arrested on murder charges, brought about by that video, but also in part by the strength of Black Lives Matter protests across America and the world. People of all backgrounds, genders and races have come together to demand change. Honor them, honor George, and make the necessary changes that make law enforcement the solution. In the run-up to Floyd's death, President Trump's critics have pointed to his dismantling of the steps Obama took to tackle racist policing. Those things we mentioned earlier, consent decrees, limiting military-grade weapons, expanding investigations into police units accused of abuses, have all been overturned under President Trump. Some campaigners are arguing for those measures to be reinstated and enforcing policies like banning chokeholds and better de-escalation training. But the Black Lives Matter movement is calling for a more radical solution. The group is demanding the money spent on policing should instead be spent on healthcare, education and community programs. The institution of the police is fundamentally corrupt and many of us believe uh, is uh, unrepairable, right? It simply must end in its current formation. And that's a deep cultural conversation that takes a long time for us to figure out. He angry at 46. I'm angry at 31. You angry at 16. Three generations of African-American men stood together here looking for solutions. Y'all coming with a better way. We ain't doing it. Oh, my God. A call to defund the police has been at the centre of the Black Lives Matter campaign since 2016, but now it has media attention. Countries around the world are now working out what Black Lives Matter means to them, and campaigners hope that the year 2020 will be the last time they'll need to have protests like this again. So, this kind of in-depth historiography, I think, is an important one because, again, it, it enunciates how this problem of racism and policing has been a part of the larger problem of racism in the United States. And then also, I think what is important is we see how uh, vast um, the denial of Black life has been, you know, in our country. And we see this, you know, with a lot of the other, um, uh, data out there. Uh, I'm going to skip over this uh, only for time, um, but I will get into some more of the data points um, because what we can see is huge economic disparities here on the right in terms of, um, you know, income. So the top, we can see the growth of U.S. top 1% income and huge amounts of child poverty by uh, race, um, where almost all uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, all minority communities have higher um, uh, child poverty rates uh, for those 16 and under five, under 16 and under five compared to white populations. Secondly, uh, we can see huge incarceration rates. This data we've seen before, but I wanted to revisit it here in terms of arrest rates here on the right and then distributions of prison sentences overwhelmingly um, black arrest rates are always higher, right, um, per year. Uh, and uh, the distribution of prison sentences, both as plea officer, plea office, plea offers, I'm sorry. And then the length of prisons um, are always higher for African-Americans. Uh, lastly, or not lastly, but next we can see uh, cities with higher African-American rates have higher rates of fines. Um, and there's been a lot of data out there showing that um, uh, cities with high minority populations end up with higher fine rates. Um, and that has been used, or those, the money from those fines are used to often subsidize those poor communities. So for example, in like a Ferguson, Missouri, or in a uh, Flint, Michigan, 
or in a, you know, a other type of community, uh, um, police uh, officers or, or police agencies will go out and, uh, you know, uh, or give many fines to these high minority populations. And um, in doing so, the money from those fines are used um, to subsidize basically governmental agencies and police departments. And so there's an incentive to continuously levy these fines against communities because it's a part of the funding base, right? We, we can continue our agencies through you know, criminalizing these people and, and collecting money from their criminal or from their criminalization. Uh, and prisons have grown exponentially in the United States. So the, the links that provided here give a, li a little bit more context. Um, two things that I want to note are the last two links here. This um, link to Mother Jones shows conditions in private prisons in the United States. And it's a part of a lengthy, um, it's part of a, a, a lengthy, um, uh, investigation by Shane Bauer. Uh, notably, private prisons have grown in the United States, and we rely heavily on those, um, both at the state and the federal level, although President Biden has recently sent out a memorandum saying that he will no longer um, invest in private prisons. Um, but private prisons are, are horrific, um, and you'll see some examples in this, uh, um, in this, or in some of the clips by Shane Bauer. One particular to note was a um, African-American male who was complaining of some pain um, to uh, medical officials in the, in the prison in Louisiana. Um, he ended up losing almost all of his fingers and both of his legs up to the hip um, because he was having some serious health complications. Um, and the denial of healthcare, as we saw with the clip from um, uh, the house I live in um, with a gentleman speaking about the chain of destruction, shows how these institutions engage in this type of race-based or, or Holocaust-like destruction in um, our American cities. And I provided this reference um, with this YouTube clip on Ger German prisons to show how the UK, or not the UK, I'm sorry, how Europe treats prisoners. And it's much more humanistically. And I think what we need to do in terms of these reference, like how Europe treats prisoners as humans with, um, well-trained officials that can help reintegrate them into society versus how um, America essentially criminalizes poor people and poor people of color specifically for you know their you know behaviors, i.e., drug use, and locks them up forever, you know, with no real care, shows how um, you know we really uh, or what we really need to do in terms of uh, seeking racial justice. Um, one thing I want to know in terms of the data points that I've shown here, so a lot of these graphs is um, these high prison populations, if we correlate this by the fact that, you know, again, people of color are mostly incarcerated in the United States, these are huge um, swaths of, of segregation, essentially, because these incarceral institutions are overwhelmingly uh, populated by black and brown people, um, you know, and their growth overall shows this kind of resurgence of segregation through prisons. Um, and these huge expenditures towards um, prisons shows that the emphasis is more on segregation through incarceration rather than integration through social programs like education, right? And so a couple things to note with that data is from 1982 to 2000 here, uh, generally we saw a prison population boom to the tone of 500% or um, currently, black and brown males comprise two thirds of the prison population, about 160,000 individuals incarcerated. Um, uh, from, I'm sorry, 1985 to 2001, um, the number of youth detention centers doubled. Youth of color are three times more likely than non Hispanic white youth to be um, uh, incarcerated. In 1995, non-Hispanic white male detention rates decreased, actually, where non-Hispanic black and Hispanic male incarceration skyrocketed by 180% for black males and 140% uh, for Hispanic males, um, respectively. Um, and since 1984, in California alone, we've built 22 new male prison facilities, costing anywhere from 20, 280 to $350 million a piece. Um, where previously we had only built 12 prisons in the state from 1852 to 1964. Again, re-emphasizing that idea 
of um, mass incarceration and an emphasis on uh, incarcerating people of color over um, integrating them, right? Here we can see this uh, picture showing the emphasis on building prisons. Again, 22 prisons compared to one university. This is gonna be UC Merced, the emphasis here. Um, the CSUs did open one um, CSU uh, during that time, but it was not a new edifice. This was CSU Channel Islands up in uh, Ventura County. And CSU Channel Islands is actually important to note because um, it used to be a, a mental institution. It was actually an institution for the criminally insane um, that was closed under the Reagan administration um, because Reagan decided to defund these types of programs that were meant to help folks who were, you know, criminals essentially, but have facing mental health problems. And so we really haven't even emphasized here in the state, which has been largely progressive on education. And so again, this is what we, we now call mass incarceration or again, since 1970, our incarcerated populations have increased by 700% um, with 2.3 million people in prison today, far outpacing the, the population growth and, uh, and the increasing or decreasing crime rates. So um, uh, again, you know, just to kind of emphasize, right, we covered the persistence of anti-Black violence in BIPOC communities, civil rights movements and social justice, the end of the civil rights era, and the shift to dog whistle politics, uh, civil rights in the war on drugs, police militarization, the emergence of modern day policing and pol policing policies, criminalization, why Black Lives Matter, uh, BLM central concerns, and those data disparities uh, reflecting those concerns. Again, our, our major key terms are social justice, dog whistle politics, criminalization, and mass incarceration. If you have any questions about the stuff we've covered today, feel free to email me uh, and set up an office hours appointment. Otherwise, thank you for tuning in.